dans cette présentation, je vais décrire un modèle pédagogique conçu pour renseigner les habiletés de vie par le sport et l'activité physique. Je vais ensuite discuter mes, de mes recherches et de mon expérience pratique dans la formation d'autres en, intervenantes dans l'utilisation de ce modèle. Je vais décrire mes efforts actuels euh, pour former les enseignants et les entraîneurs à utiliser ce appro cette approche euh, dans un pays euh, d'Amérique centrale. J'espère que ces idées, ces idées et les obstacles que j'ai rencontrés résonneront pour vous et stimuleront une discussion intéressante. Et maintenant, je reviens à l'anglais pour le reste de ma présentation. Uh, merci pour votre patience. <laughs> okay, so that was oh, <laughs> so that was the the hard part. Um, so my objectives uh, for the talk today, I spoke about a little bit. As I understand it, this is not meant to be so much a research presentation. So I won't go in depth into every theory I'll refer to. I won't present the methodology behind every study. But my objective is to give you a sense of of how I approach this work, conceptually, uh, the sort of work that I engage in, in terms of the research, the empirical work, and the practical, and uh, give some examples of current projects I'm operating uh, to stimulate that discussion about professional development issues. Uh, this just gives you an idea of this slide about some of the theories and, and some of the scholars that I draw from in my work. Um, I, I believe people represent various disciplines here, but the uh, common connection is education for many. Uh, so the work of people like Dewey and Freire, the idea of democratic pedagogy and critical pedagogy is very important to me. I do draw from psychological theories like social learning theory, applying ideas of self-efficacy and the way I think about training and developing youth, as well as uh, professional development for adults. Youth development through sport is a, is a very fast-growing popular field that draws on many of these principles from education and from psychology. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary field that is focused primarily on the idea of uh, sport programming in, in the community setting, competitive sport, summer camps, things like that. Um, what I'll focus on more today is the idea of social and emotional learning because that's more based in the school context. But in reality, so many of these principles are similar and, th and they overlap. To present this in through the lens of social and emotional learning, I'll, I'll present what they consider five core areas or aspects of social and emotional learning, including things like, as you can read, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Uh, this is just one framework for organizing these ideas, but essentially, as you can see, they've, they've organized things into s social skills, personal skills, and in this model, they've separated out the idea of responsible decision-making uh, as overarching. As I said, I won't go into extreme detail on the idea of individual studies. I just put this slide up to show that there is uh, extensive empirical research. This is uh, a meta-analysis of 213 individual studies on these uh, sorts of competencies, these personal and social skills. And there's very convincing evidence that this can really be an important part of a well-rounded education for children. Again, most of this work is based in the academic setting, either in school or perhaps after school programming that's meant to support academic achievement. But for me, like any, uh, like the positive youth development orientation, my commitment is not just to the idea of outcomes like improved school success, but the holistic development of the child. So for instance, yes, it can help children in terms of being successful in school, but it can also help them in terms of uh, their life outcomes and their health outcomes and helping them to reach their full potential in various parts of life, not just to get that better grade in their, their math class or their English class. Uh, this slide I put up just to, just to let you know that in addition to the research on the idea of social emotional learning in the United States, there's also a lot of policy activity around this notion that it really should be integrated into the educational system as part of our core curriculum and our values. Uh, there, this was an act that has not yet been passed, but I, I love this quote because as, as this senator in proposing this legislation says, 
in addition to those individual outcomes for the youth, which should be positive and, and uh, based in their individual potential, this is also important for a society. This is developing the skills and the dispositions that make for a better society when all citizens value these things. To bring it back to the more concrete level, uh, national legislation has not passed yet, but in, at the state level, for instance, in my state of Illinois, they have adopted social and emotional learning standards. So whatever the subject area is, whatever the grade level is, teachers in the public education system are expected to teach and promote these skills. And they use the same framework that I presented earlier, developed by a group in Chicago. I'm happy to, for those interested, I can give you that uh, reference later. Most of the work I do relates to physical activity, physical education, and sport. So I just put this slide up there also as an example. I, I think uh, in, in the different provinces in Canada and many other countries, you'll see similar statements in the content standards for physical education. They address these sorts of skills and, and dispositions directly. You know, the idea of how you conduct yourself and how you treat other people in that sport setting is important and it's part of what we're supposed to be teaching. So this is not new or foreign to the idea of a uh, physical education curriculum. So with that idea of uh, the, the concept of social and emotional learning and these values that we want to promote, it begs the question, so how do you teach that? You, you, how do you ask a teacher to teach someone or coach a student to be more responsible or to be a better leader or to make more responsible choices? To begin that discussion, I want to bring up the idea of life skills. Uh, if, uh, again, I'll use sport and physical activity examples because it's most of my work. If, if you, or you, let's use one of your examples. I do not play hockey. I know nothing about hockey. So, if I was going to begin, I don't boo. Uh, if I was going to start learning hockey, what are some skills I would have to learn? Fighting. Fighting. <laughs> uh, wow. I did not say that. Where's the camera? That was... Jean-Francois, um, what's a, a skill I would have to learn? Skating. skating, okay, I don't know how to skate. So would you just tell me, Paul, it's important to skate. Go skate. You might say that, but I'm, I don't know how to skate. You need to teach me the technique. You need to show me how it's done. Explain it to me. Give me, say, no, uh, your ankle's turning out, your ankle's turning in, bend your knees. You would break the skill down and teach it and you'd let me practice. If I fell down the first time, would you say, Paul, you're done, leave. You <laughs> Some people might. But, <laughs> but my point is, think of other skills. We, we know that we have to give instruction. We know that we have to break it down and teach the student, what do I mean by that? What does it look like? We have to let them practice and let them fail and coach them and give them feedback. That's how we develop a skill. So I would say the same thing applies to personal and social skills. If we want to teach students about these things, we have to explain what do I mean by responsibility? What do I mean by leadership? What does it look like in this class? Then I have to let the students practice those things and fail and get it wrong. But then I coach them, right? It's the same process. So one of the things that I say about life skills, this definition here, they're skills that can be taught and practiced in one setting, like hockey, but skating won't help me at work. Skating isn't helping me do this lecture. You know, uh, if you think about basketball, shooting a free throw, that's a basketball skill. You don't use it anywhere else. But uh, things like goal setting, making good choices, cooperating with others, those are skills you can learn and practice in one context, but use them anywhere else. Those are life skills. So that's the way I approach the teaching of responsibility, life skills, social emotional learning. So with that orientation, I'll now talk about this uh, teaching personal and social responsibility model. This is the, the pedagogical model that I specialize in. Just a little brief history. This was developed by a gentleman in uh, who, when I worked with him, was based in Chicago, Don Hellison. And he began this work over 40 years ago, uh, working primarily in practice, working with at-risk youth, children who were in trouble with the law, or low educational outcomes, involved in crime. Uh, so it was developed in very tough environments, but his goal was to figure out how can I help work with these kids to teach them skills that would help them 
do, uh, have better life outcomes, to make better choices and reach their full potential. So he developed this approach with a, a very big focus on the affective domain and this idea of personal and social skills before they were a major focus like they are nowadays. And the basic concept is using that physical activity experience as a vehicle, as a way to teach life skills. Because it presents great, it's interactive, it's social, it is emotional, right? You get mad when you lose, you get mad when you get hit, you get into fights. <laughs> so it's a great opportunity in an authentic way to practice these skills and learn these skills. This model is very empowerment based, so it's, it's student centered. It tries to create a democratic environment where the students have a lot of choice and a lot of voice in the program. And although Don Hellison developed it in inner city environments in, in uh, Chicago is where most of his work was done, we found that it, it applies in very different contexts, not only with children living in poverty or inner city environments, but uh, children living in suburban or rural environments. We all need these same skills. You know, going back to the social emotional learning concept, everyone needs to develop these things. And that's another reason it's, it's been very popular in, uh, it's, it's in other countries. Sylvie mentioned several of them at the beginning where this has taken root. And people are finding it really transfers well, these ideas and these practices. I won't go into the full detail of the model, but I'll just give you a couple uh, slides to, to tell you the, the essential elements. Um, if, if people just know a little bit about this model, what they usually know about is the, the TPSR levels. Um, uh, the levels uh, term is popular, but that makes you think it's step by step by step. And that isn't exactly right. Uh, it's, it's, it's a progression, but it's not automatically one step and the next. So I refer to them as goals more often. In the program setting, these are the values, the, the characteristics that we're trying to promote in the children. Things like respecting the rights and feelings of others, self-direction, leadership. The next thing that most people know if they've read about Don's work, Don Hellison's work, or studied with him, is uh, there's a certain class format. And, and it's really very simple. The idea that he developed was you have to talk to the kids about these skills. You can't just assume they, they are absorbing that or learning of what you think they're learning. So you have an awareness talk, which is just at the beginning of the lesson, talking about what we're going to emphasize, what's really important in this program, reminding them of those values and giving, the, giving them a chance to be part of the planning, too, uh, having a say in the program. But that's just a few minutes. Most of the time, 90% of the time, is spent in physical activity. Uh, so if somebody just looked in the gymnasium, they would just say, oh, they're doing basketball, or they're doing floor hockey. Um, but if you're doing this model well, in that physical activity, you're integrating responsibilities. So you're giving kids chances to practice leadership. You're giving them chances to make choices. If a conflict comes up, you're not always stepping in as the teacher to solve the problem. You let the students learn how to resolve a conflict on their own. So again, like my idea of learning how to skate, you don't just tell the students, it's important to be a leader, you should be a good leader. You have to give them chances to be in charge of something, right? Let them practice that skill, let them be in charge of other students. So that's what's different about the physical activity. The sport content is the same, but the interactions with the students are structured to, to let them live and experience those responsibilities. And at the end, it looks like a lot, but the group meeting and reflection time, it would just look like sitting down with the kids for five minutes at the end. The first part, the group meeting, gives people a chance to comment on the day. The kids get to evaluate. How did they like the lesson? What did they like the best? What do they think we should change the next time? Making suggestions. Um, and maybe giving feedback on the instructor, too. Uh, really giving them that some power and some voice. And then the reflection time is just the next part of the meeting where you ask them to reflect as individuals. How did I do personally today with my self-control? Maybe the group did a, had a lot of trouble overall, but I know that I controlled my mouth and I controlled my temper, so I did a good job today. But it's promoting that idea of reflection so that these ideas, you don't just hope that by osmosis they learn these lessons. You get them to talk about it. You make sure they understand what it means and what it looks like, and you train them to self-evaluate and self-reflect. 
As I said, I won't review or discuss individual studies, but I just have a couple slides here to, to illustrate the point that over the last several decades, and, and especially in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been an increase in the empirical research on this model. Um, there have been plenty of uh, quantitative and qualitative studies, mixed methodology studies, um, and most of them have looked at evaluating program effectiveness uh, and, and looking at the impact on youth or the perceptions of the youth in the programs. Um, we have uh, correlational studies and quasi-experimental designs connecting to variables like you know, self-efficacy, self-regulated learning, uh, and consistently these, these studies are confirming what we would expect from, from practice and what we've experienced, those of us who use the model. One of the major uh, goals of this model is the idea of transfer. Uh, it was listed earlier. You, you can practice the respect and self-control and effort and leadership in the program, and that makes for a good program. But the ultimate goal is to help students use these skills elsewhere, you know, that idea of life skills that transfer. So that's what we really want to happen. Yes, they learn to skate better. They, they get, uh, have a better slap shot. But we also want to know that they've learned things about leadership in here that they can take back to school or that in the future they can use in their community. So that's also a growing body of research is us asking those questions. How much do students see the relevance and make the connections between what we do in the program and choices they make in life beyond the program? So with that review of this model, right, the first thing I asked is, so how do we teach this stuff to kids? <laughs> Now, now, I don't know if you could say this in English. I could not say this in French. But the idea is, so then if everybody uh, agrees or those involved agree, yes, this is important content, and it's content we should teach to children. That begs the question then, so how do you teach teachers to do that? How do you train them to do it? So now we've come to this, this idea. We'll start easing into the idea of uh, professional development and teacher training. Uh, I've said a little bit about the background of the model, so a little more history on this. When Don Hellison started developing this back in the 1970s, uh, there were very few people doing this work. Um, most people didn't know what he was doing. His, his, uh, at his university, his, his uh, department chair told him, hey, I heard you're writing a book. I, I hope you're doing that on your own time. You know, that's <laughs> don't do that on our time. <laughs> um, he didn't have a lot of support or a lot of interest for what he was doing. Um, and it was done mostly in practice. It wasn't a part of a research agenda. It was him trying to figure out how can he achieve these things with youth? What's working? What's not working? How can he make it uh, structured and consistent in a way that helps the kids? So for the first 20 years of this model, there was no professional development. There was no training. It was just this one guy, <laughs> just this one man doing the work. So it was not an issue for the first half of its history. And then as people would read what Don was writing and the model became more popular, people became interested in it, um, he would talk at conferences, he would you know, do presentations and workshops like this, but that's not really training people, that's just dissemination of the ideas. Uh, so that was sort of very cursory, surface level uh, exposure. There were a handful of people like myself that went and worked with Don Hellison. So I was a graduate student with him. I worked with him directly for six years. So I learned to do the model, you know, I think I learned it pretty well. But that was almost like an apprenticeship. That's not a very uh, efficient model. It might be effective, but it's not an efficient way to do professional development, to go live in a monastery for six years. And <laughs> uh, so, so really, uh, for the first 30 years now, we've got very little plan or strategy for how to train people in using this model. Um, one of the things, though, we realized as it was being disseminated and translated into different languages and used in different countries, we became concerned for the, the effectiveness of this model. You know, if it's diffused, if people are using it that don't really understand it, that's a problem. For me personally, I became concerned, what if people are doing research on this and publishing findings, but they didn't really understand it and implement it correctly? So this, this began some conversations um, that really had to do with the idea of looking at, um, I'm sorry, let me go back one. 
w with the idea of broader dissemination I, on this last point. So this prompted me to start thinking about the idea of fidelity. Different people might implement this in different ways, but to call it TPSR, there must be some essential qualities, right, or essential characteristics. At what point is it not TPSR anymore, but it's cooperative learning or adventure-based learning? So it, it started me thinking about what makes it distinct and unique. Um, and then the other side of that, though, is how do you have that conversation about the essential elements without being prescriptive, without telling people on day four of week three, you should give students an opportunity to lead a group. I don't know you, I don't know the kids you work with, I don't know your context. So that's, that's the, the tension. So as we've started working with this, several of us, uh, not just myself, but other colleagues have played with this idea of how to train people to use this model. Some of the things we've learned, and mostly, mostly through failure, is, um, like I said before, if, if people don't implement it, or if they don't understand it, they don't implement it. You can't test it. Um, we had several people trying to publish things on TPSR, and their conclusion in the end was, well, it's inconclusive because it didn't really happen, um, <laughs> which reflected the fact that we had no real structured training. Um, and so we realized, okay, we need to do concrete training. There's a group I work with in Spain that said, okay, we're gonna really train people. Anybody that teaches in this program has 30 hours of training before they go out and implement. But the problem was, they realized later, all 30 hours were in a classroom talking about self-efficacy and you know, positive psychology and these principles. So they got structured training and they got a lot of it, but it wasn't practical. And then as we began to integrate those two things, more structure, but also making it hands-on and practical, experiential, uh, we also have learned that the more we can individualize it for the person learning, and these are common principles to professional development, right? The more it can be individualized to their context, their style, for them to see the relevance and tailor it, that's when it really starts to work. But again, we have to say, well, what about the fidelity? How can you balance those two things? So these are the, the, the things we've been trying to work with in the last few years. But uh, one thing we've seen consistently is that the more we do those things and the more we try to stay true to the principles of TPSR, which is to make it empowerment-based, democratic, and learner-centered, this is for the adults too. The training for adults works better when we stay true to the values of the model. So f for, for a moment, just think, is somebody could train someone to do TPSR, but if they never, if I'm training you guys, but I never ask you questions, I never give you a choice, I never let you use your own creativity, I'm not modeling the approach. I mean, so the one thing, it will make it harder for you to learn it because you still haven't seen it, <laughs> right? But if I can actually model it, that's another way for the learning to be better. And then more so, if, if I do that, then you are taking ownership. You're really understanding the concepts because you're applying it. You're crossing it with your own values and creativity. So the more we stay true to the actual principles of the model, the better job we can do training other people to use it. So over the last several years, as I've been trying to find this balance between looking at the idea of fidelity, but also being uh, flexible, in how we train people and how they implement the model, I developed a, a certain tool. It's an observational tool. Uh, I'll call it the TEAR, the Tool for Assessing Responsibility-Based Education. So it's a systematic observation tool. You know, I, I would observe somebody teaching, uh, teaching their class and every three minutes I'm coding how much do I see the teacher doing certain behaviors, how much do I see the students engaging in certain in, uh, interactions, and I'm just documenting and coding these things. We can do several things with that data. Uh, in the context of a research project, this could be a great check on fidelity, right? I mean, so many studies have, in English, we call it the black box, right? Somebody tries to do an intervention study, and in the end, the results are inconclusive, but when they ask, well, did you deliver the intervention? What data do you have to support the quality of the intervention? They have nothing. So this can be really important in intervention studies when you want to document exactly what was delivered, what experiences did the youth have. 
and use that to interpret your results. It can also be used just to improve and uh, inform a program. You know, if a, if a, a school district says, we really want to promote social and emotional learning, we want our PE teachers doing this, uh, this is data that could be used to say, you're doing some things very well, but here's what you could improve. Here's where your professional development funds might go. Um, and then also, it, when I originally developed it, I had in mind that it could be useful for training. As it turns out, that's become one of the primary uses of this model. Um, people in the US and then also here in Canada, Sylvie being one of the people that's translated it into French, it's been translated into Spanish, Portuguese, Turkish at this point. So a lot of people have found it useful in promoting, educating people on this model and evaluating the implementation of it. So just in brief, I'll give you an idea of the content. One of the, the core sections for this uh, instrument is looking at the teacher behaviors and coding how often and how strongly are teachers using different strategies that align with the TPSR model. And you might notice, let me see if my, yeah, this works. So you might notice this is a continuum. Modeling respect and setting clear expectations, this isn't unique to TPSR. I would consider that common to any good teaching. If, if anyone is not doing those first three things, they should not be a teacher. They should not be teaching, right? That's fundamental. But that's part of my rationale is it's fundamental to good teaching. If someone isn't modeling respectful behavior to students, I don't care if they say they're using TPSR or not. They, 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 need, they need more help than this. <laughs> so it's important to document those things. Even though they're foundational and not unique to TPSR, they have to be there. And as you move down this continuum, you start to see things that are more learner-centered, that shift more power and share more responsibility with students. So those, qual those behaviors in the middle, fostering social interaction, um, giving students management tasks, giving them some roles and responsibilities, that's, that's not so rare, right? Good teachers do that. Uh, but not all teachers do that. Then when you get farther down the line, letting students evaluate you as a coach or a teacher, that's not so common. Not, not impossible, but it's not common practice. Letting students decide, should we stay on hockey for another two weeks or are we ready to move on to volleyball? Let's vote. Letting students decide what their goals need to be and set their goals for improvement on their own now, now we're getting more empowerment based. And then also role and assessment. Uh, very few teachers give students any power to assess their own work um, or to do peer assessment. But when you do those things, the students are learning the material better and you're giving them some trust and some power. And then finally, this idea of transfer, that even the very best teachers uh, who are very student-centered, uh, this is probably the, the most rare thing to see in common practice is that they, they talk explicitly about life skills and how can you use these skills that we're learning in other parts of life. So another thing we've learned initially from practice and from our, our growing body of research and now I've built it into this tear tool is what are the student behaviors that come along with this? Uh, these aren't a perfect one-to-one -one match but you can see how they align I hope. Um, so, for instance, if the teacher is modeling respect and promoting respectful behavior, we expect to see that more among the students. If the teacher is setting clear expectations, organizing things that, so that everybody can be successful, we tend to see high levels of participation and engagement. If the teacher gives students leadership roles and talks about that. What does it look like to be a leader? How can you be a good leader? How can you support each other and help each other? We tend to see more cooperation, encouragement, helping, and leading. So again, it's two sides of the same coin. If, if, I, if I go into a, a classroom or a gymnasium and students are never encouraging or helping or leading each other, it doesn't necessarily mean these are bad kids. I have to ask, what does the teacher give them a chance? Does the teacher ever provide a structure for peer interaction and for, for helping and encouraging others. If not, that's what I want to focus on as my next step, is how can we get the teacher to create those structures and those opportunities. Um, 
I think I've made my point there. So as I said, this, this instrument was developed so that it could serve various purposes, but one of the things that's, that's become apparent is it's, it's most widely used right now as a way to teach people about this model. Uh, as I said, Don Hellison's approach was very rooted in practice and his own values. These values have stayed consistent and hold true, but one of the problems with trying to train people in values is, let, let's do this right now. Raise your hand if you think it's important for students to respect others. Okay, easy, so we're done, right? <laughs> Th these things are such commonly held truths that people would go to a workshop or a training and say, oh yeah, I, I believe students should uh, be good decision makers. I believe students should have leadership roles and, th and that they should interact well. But then they leave the training or the workshop and they say, okay, but what do I do? What do I do differently now? You know, when, when the class comes back on Tuesday next week, how do I do that with them, right? <laughs> so this is one of the things it turns out that I think the tear has really helped a lot of people with, with those concrete teaching strategies, is people can really get their hand on it and say, that's what I want to do next Tuesday. I need to start by making sure I'm modeling respectful behavior. I've got a clear plan. It's set up so everybody can participate and feel successful. Good, I do those things already. What I don't do is give students leadership roles. How can I integrate student leadership on Tuesday? It, it takes those values and the general philosophy and makes it very concrete. Um, and you don't have to do every one of those strategies every time, but now you have a framework for assessing wh what am I implementing? What am I not touching yet? Um, one of the things that I think it's helping people with as they're trained in this approach is it's, they're, they're, it's not just values. I think it's got to start with the values, but they become better able to analyze and critique their own practice and when they watch others practice. So they're really using higher level thinking skills. If they can use this as a post-teaching reflection to give peer feedback, they're, they're actually doing analysis and they're developing a sharper eye for seeing examples of this. What's the difference between students just hanging around talking and a teacher fostering social interaction. We get into really granular, refined discussions about things like that. So it pushes their understanding of what it is, what it's not, what does it look like. Um, and what I hope I've accomplished with it is a balance between that idea of fidelity and flexibility. So for example, uh, leadership is an easy one. Leadership, I would say, is a strategy. That's something generally that we want to achieve. It's a goal that, that if you're doing that, we know it aligns with TPSR. But if someone is teaching um, you know, uh, physical education to seven-year-olds, someone else is teaching science to 17-year-olds, what does leadership look like in their class? That's a tactic. That would be very different. You know, in this case, maybe I let students come up and stand in front of the group and lead warm-up exercises. And for them, that's fine. That's appropriate leadership. In this class, maybe we have the students in lab groups and every lab group has a leader with very set roles. So that's where the flexibility comes in. If you're doing TPSR, I, w I would like to see these certain strategies coming out. But how you apply it in your setting with your students, that's up to you. So now I'll, I'll, uh, coming toward the end, I'm just going to share a project where I've been able currently to put all these ideas uh, to the test. I'm working in Belize. This is a very small country in Central America. Uh, the total population is 370,000, the entire nation. Uh, their largest city, Belize City, has a population of 70,000. So it's, it's a very small uh, country. One interesting thing about the population, it's a very young population too. More than 50% of the population is under 18 years old. So the context is very interesting. Um, the project I'm working with, in j the, the go purpose statement is to promote youth development and social change through sport and physical activity. Uh, this project is funded by the US State Department and any, anybody who funds something is funding for a reason, right? That why are they concerned? What Belize, you'll see on the map here, is just south of Mexico. 
Uh, so it's a major point of drug trafficking as drugs are moving up. So there's a lot of violence. There's a lot of gang and criminal activity. It's a major point for drug trafficking. So this is why the U.S. State Department is interested in promoting youth development, positive youth development, a stable citizenship. But uh, that's fine. I'll take their money. Because <laughs> um, really, it's, it's not as holistic as, as my philosophy, but it lets me do the work I want to do. So this is the project I'm running there and why they're promoting it. It's a three-year project that involves two-way exchange. Um, for the first two years, a, a delegation of Belizeans would come up to the U.S. for training and site visits, uh, and then a, I would take a team of uh, my colleagues down to Belize to train coaches and teachers and youth workers. We did two full cycles of that in the first two years, and this third year now the focus has shifted to them uh, hopefully we've built the capacity for them to continue doing this on their own um, and to seek sustainability funding uh, so that they don't rely on us for this to continue. Um, the, the core, uh, a core structure to this project is in Belize, because it's such a small country, they have so many small organizations and very few of them can do a lot of professional development or innovation on their own. But there are so many of these organizations that provide youth sport programming. So that's why it's called a coalition. The idea was to get people from all these different city government or national government or a YMCA, non-for-profit organizations, any groups that offer youth sport programming to come together as a coalition to cooperate and have this shared mission to hopefully uh, have some synergy between their efforts and a common commitment. In, in brief, now we're in the third year of the project. At this point, we, we've had a total of 13 Belizeans have come up, and these have either been um, managers or directors of organizations or influential coaches that we really wanted to help them see how do you help an organization to implement and adopt this, this approach. Uh, when we've gone down to Belize, we've worked with a total of 75 coaches, teachers, youth workers, police officers, people from these various uh, over 20 organizations that deliver youth sport programming. Um, it, now there's some duplication in this number, but between summer camp programming, after school programming, and, and physical education during the year, this, uh, these, these 75 people have, have worked with a count of 5,000 participants or more. Um, and again, with the population as small as it is, uh, this is a unique opportunity to really have a, a, a significant change on the culture of youth sport. I'm not claiming that we're there yet, but it's more feasible to achieve that there in that context than it would be in Canada or in the U.S. to say there's really a unifying approach. Um, and the, they continue to expand partnerships and add organizations. They're at the point where they're ready now to deliver their next training. Uh, I, I want to highlight here a key, that, a key to our strategy has been these local experts that we've really given advanced training and we've groomed them as the people who can continue doing training for new people two and three years from now when we're not coming down anymore um, and people to provide leadership and stimulate more partnerships. So a lot of this hinges on their expertise and their investment. So the tear, I've explained it in detail and how I think it supports training. This has been uh, an anchor for our approach to the training in Belize. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy with how I've seen it working. For one thing, in, in the training with the teachers and the administrators, we want to make sure everyone can see in a concrete way. This isn't just a, 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 a wall hold hands and talk about how, how important it is to be nice to one another. We're giving them concrete strategies and competencies that they can assess how well they're doing and they can implement. Um, so we use this, the TEAR strategies as a source of feedback. So as we're, as we're delivering lessons, as we're modeling lessons, as we're letting volunteers come up and try to demonstrate how would you integrate leadership or foster cooperation in this activity, we're all developing a common framework and a common vocabulary uh, w with, with those TEAR strategies. And then it's a tool then that I can use when I go back for my consulting visits and site visits. Now I have a concrete structure to assess how much are they implementing the training. I can tell, I know exactly what they were trained to do. We all speak the same language. 
Now, if I come back a few months later and observe programming, and I say to the teacher, you're doing a great job with all these things, but I'm not seeing any talk about transfer. How could we think about some ways in that lesson you just taught? What were some opportunities uh, to identify a life skill, talk to the kids about it, and stimulate their thinking? So it really, that ongoing support is much facilitated by having this clear framework. And then part of the, the, uh, those nine trainers that we developed, part of what I, I wanted to do with them is really teach them how to use the tear as a feedback tool so that they would then be qualified when we're gone to go and observe their peers or the people that they've trained and give that same kind of feedback. So it, when, when that group came up to Chicago, one of the things we did is I trained them how to use the observation tool and we had a, a proficiency test where they had to achieve at least 80% agreement, inter-rater agreement with me in applying that and in, in observing a live PE class. So we can say exactly what have they been trained to do, what are they qualified to do, and it's all uh, very coherent, you know, from the initial training to how feedback is given, keeps reinforcing those very concrete, actionable strategies. Uh, just toward the end here, some general comments. Um, the, the tear I've highlighted as, as important as, as a specific technique, but that's not the only thing that's working for us. Um, I think some other things just in terms of professional development that we've been doing well is whether it's TPSR or not, whether it's the tear or not, the fact that we've involved the trainees in developing the process. You know, we, from the very beginning, we said, we don't know Belize. We, we didn't grow up here. We don't work with the kids you work with. We need you to help us shape the examples and to find out how is this relevant. So we've, we've involved their voice in actively shaping the curriculum. And even day to day, when we're down there for a four-day training, uh, one session to the next or one day to the next might be shaped by their input. Trying to create that democratic environment as I said, if we don't model this, if we can't do it when we have four days to work with them, why should we expect that they'll do it when they go out and work with kids in that summer program? Um, finding local champions. No matter how good an outsider is, if they're an external expert or a consultant, no matter how good they are, that's all they're ever going to be. If you don't have local expertise and local champions, the, the odds of a training or a professional development continuing. And that's always my goal is, is this sustainable? Have we built this in a way that it's gonna go on without us in three years? Um, I think that's an essential element. So we've really kept a focus on that. Um, and trying to really foster transformational learning experiences, developing that critical pedagogy and, and these trainees, especially our, our nine uh, trainers, really helping them to become more critical of what is and isn't happening in youth sport. Um, so they can really take that ownership. Um, building a critical mass, especially since we're dealing with building a coalition, if we get enough influential figures and enough influential offices and enough coaches and teachers using this approach and on the same page, that critical mass is gonna help to carry on. So the numbers do matter, I think. Um, and then all, along with that, establishing credibility. Our partners down there have told us from the beginning, if we, don't, if we aren't recognized by the national organizations, or if we don't have the support of certain people, people won't want it, they'll say, well, why should I be involved in that? You know, so they have to have a track record. They have to have credibility and do good work and build a reputation. So it's, it's, it's been hard work. It's not been all successes for sure. Um, some of the other issues that I think are probably common to a lot of professional development, uh, we're dealing with changing attitudes and norms. A lot of coaches and a lot of PE teachers are, are in, in, do what they do because they love sport. But they came up in a culture of you know, winning is everything and, and the focus on competition. So a lot of individuals, even though they'd say, oh yeah, leadership is great, Voice is great. Empowerment, that's all good. But when they get in front of the kids, they go back to coaching the same way they were always coached. And sometimes it's unintentional and they don't even realize it. That's where that feedback and that ongoing follow-through helps. So that's an obstacle always, I think. Um, the, the idea of following up, like I said, because everybody on the way out the door agrees, oh yeah, I love this stuff, I'm going to do that. But then you go see them 
implementing and you find those, those teachable moments. Um, sometimes the organizations uh, are, are a challenge. The individual might really have the right values and want to do it, but if they're the boss, the director they report to says, no, you know, we don't have time for that or we're not going to change the way we do things, they run into those obstacles. So sometimes it's at the individual level, sometimes it, it's at the organizational level. But those are the things in a project like this you just are continually trying to navigate and understand. The political context and how much, you know, trying to get this office and that office to work together. You know, if you find out the directors are from different departments, it won't happen. It's not about values or what's good for the kids, it's a political party thing. The, my favorite example of this, they're in, within the same mayor's office, there, there's a, an office uh, the, in charge of sport programs, and there's an office in charge of after-school programs. But they will not work together, so we don't have after-school sport programs. You know, and, and it's just because they, they won't share credit. So, so things like that vary project to project, and you have to navigate. But those things that happen up here really influence how, how well is your professional development or your training going to uh, stick and be implemented. Uh, so, so in conclusion, just a few things that, that whether you work with the same sort of content or framework or not, I think lessons we've learned and successes we've found that are pretty transferable include these. I think part of our success comes down to the fact that we have a very clear uh, set of objectives. I mean, our, our values, what we're trying to accomplish are very clearly defined and we're very intentional in how we promote those things. Uh, that's a good base to work from. Uh, and then this addition with the tear of concrete competencies, I think that is where a lot of professional development and trainings fall short. The discussions are great at the time, but when people leave and you ask them the next week, well, what did you learn? <laughs> what, what did you learn how to do? Um, it's hard to answer those questions. It's a continual balance uh, to, to uh, keep fidelity and flexibility um, working together. So I wouldn't say we're done with this, but I think the fact that we recognize the importance of that and we always keep a focus on it is serving us well. The idea of local ownership and buy-in, I've explained this before, whatever the professional development or training is, if you want it to survive past that intervention or that workshop if you don't have some buy-in at the local level. I think uh, the odds are low. Another thing in this program, we've really committed to systematic evaluation. And I think the fact that our evaluation has really aligned with the content we're teaching and has been used actively to inform and improve and give feedback, I think that's strengthened, uh, strengthened the approach through that coherence. Uh, and then uh, ongoing support. We've had the luxury of three years of contact. If this would have ended at year one, it would have been done. It would have been dead after we left. If it was at, at, at year two, I was really getting nervous at the end of year two because I still didn't have that natural leader coming up and I couldn't picture who's going to manage things or organize things when we're gone because until I call or show up, nothing happens. Now we're in year three. It's not a guarantee, but I've seen a lot more progress. But it's taken a full three years to get to the point where I can see the, I can picture it now, how this might be sustainable. It does not happen in a one-shot deal. Um, how's that for an American expression, a one-shot deal with a snap? Everybody got that? <laughs> um, and then again, this just highlights, I think, the importance of contextual factors. Whatever your context is, whatever the content is, if you don't integrate that into the planning, into how, what you deliver and how you deliver it and who you get involved, uh, and being able to anticipate obstacles, uh, uh, good teaching of any kind at any level is, is in context, right? The material, who's delivering it, who's supposed to be receiving it, and, and, and the, 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 the cultural issues in the backdrop need to be considered. So I hope this was enough to give you a sense of who I am, what I do, and the things I'm actively working with, and, and we'll see if that can translate into some discussion. Merci beaucoup.